everyone. It's great that you're able to join with us this morning. Whether you're a regular or like me, you're, I'm only on my second Sunday. I'm the new minister here in Glengormley and you're very welcome. Whether you've been here all of your life or really you're, you're possibly just catching this online and looking for the ability um, to worship, you're really welcome with us. This morning we're going to spend a little bit of time reflecting on the Bible and what the Bible says about living in a time of real pressure. And we'll be looking at that later in the service. But let me begin It's from Psalm 47. It says, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. We're going to worship God together. Singing. Worshipping together. Giving him his due of what he is worth. It's a wonderful privilege and we give to do that this morning. Just before we come to sing, allow me to bring us into worship by praying together. Let's pray. Father God, we gather online and on screens, scattered and apart, yet together in unity because of Jesus. We are part of your family brought in by the death of Jesus for each of us. We thank you for your plan to bring salvation to each of us even before we were born. You are truly good and truly holy. There is no one else like you. Father, we confess that we are easily turned by the world around us. We confess as we gather that we have not fully followed you this week. And we have accidentally, deliberately and by not acting your good and perfect will for us. We ask for your forgiveness and we turn away from what is not from you. We ask that you would work in our lives to bring us into fuller and deeper knowledge of your love and grace, even when that will change our lives more. Help us this morning as we gather to be attentive to you, to discern your leading in our lives. May our worship be worthy to you through Jesus who makes us righteous. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're going to praise God together now in, in two songs.
Today's story is from Luke chapter 8 and it's all about Jesus calming the storm. 
I wonder if you've ever been on a boat. This is my little boat in the back garden. We're pretending that I'm on a little boat. Or maybe you've been in the ferry just in Roar. You probably have never been on your own because we need a grown-up to go with us, somebody to look after us and take care of us. But if you've ever been on the ferry or on a boat and you go outside and it's blowy and windy and we can all feel a little bit afraid because we're high up and it's stormy and we don't like it. The story today has the disciples and they're on the boat and a storm comes and they get really, really afraid. The disciples were in the boat and it was a huge storm. <laughs> The disciples were really, really afraid. They were scared. They thought they were going to drown in the storm. And then they remembered that Jesus was in the boat with them. And they woke Jesus up and Jesus said, Stop! And the whole storm stopped and the disciples were safe. And the thing that I'd love you to remember today, that when life is hard and we maybe feel afraid or scared or things seem a little bit out of control, that Jesus is always with us when life is difficult because the Bible says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be with us and we'll never be on our own when we're friends with Jesus. That's the lesson for today. Thank you very much. Today's reading can be taken from Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. Jesus calms the storm. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. On the way across, Jesus lay down for a nap. And while he was sleeping, the wind began to rise. A fierce storm developed that threatened to swamp them. And they were in real danger. The disciples woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. So Jesus rebuked the wind and the raging waves. The storm stopped and all was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? And they were filled with awe and amazement. They said to one another, Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? Here ends the reading. Thank you, Samuel, for reading God's word to us today. I thought I'd take advantage for a few moments and just bring us down by the lock. The Sea of Galilee is really a lake, a lock in our language. It's 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. Our own lock here in Belfast is 12 miles long and 3 to 5 miles wide. So Lock Galilee is twice as wide, but we understand the length and the shape of this body of water. Jesus and the disciples are crossing the lake, obviously on a boat big enough for them all to fit on. Four of the disciples, as we have them, are professional fishermen. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John. It might even have been one of their family's boats. They know this water. They are from here. And as they sail, Jesus is asleep in the boat with his head on a cushion or in a rolled up coat. Asleep probably from exhaustion. But Jesus is comfortable and safe. He's at peace. You only really sleep when you feel safe. And this storm comes up. Chaos from the natural world. And in this really short description, really quite quickly, the disciples are scared and anxious. They're afraid. They're confined in this boat and they can't get out of their circumstances. But notice that Jesus isn't scared, afraid, anxious, that he sleeps through this. He's soundly resting during the fear and the terror that others are experiencing. The disciples think they're going to drown. Eventually they wake Jesus really to tell him that they're all going to drown. And then we have this incredible sign of Jesus' power. Jesus scolds the wind and the waves. He tells them off. The one who John tells us spoke the universe into existence puts order back into the natural world and all is calm. Where is your faith? Where is your trust? And in this early stage, we see the response of the disciples. Who is this? He commands the wind and the waves. There is no one else like him. I think there are some parallels to the experience of the disciples and our current experience of being in coronavirus. I should tell you this morning, this is a passage in the Bible that I come back to regularly in my own life. I think there is deep truth in this little moment as it's recorded. It's only a few verses. I couldn't get much briefer. And yet, there is a lot happening here. 
I think this event in the life of the disciples would have been quite defining. Could you imagine if you were on this boat later in your life, getting together with the people who were there and remembering this? You remember being, Imagine being one of the 12 disciples and you gather 10 years later, 20 years later, and you're remembering some of the instances and you remember this moment. You remember the fear and the trauma. You remember the thought that we were, you were all going to die. And then you remember waking Jesus and he speaks and the entire environment changes. This encounter would certainly have been transformative. Who is this man? It is unforgettable. I want to let this story hold our attention this morning as I think it can help us in the season of coronavirus. It applies in any season, to be clear with you. I want to try and apply it in our current climate that we're in. This year is really unlike any other. The overused word of 2020 has to be unprecedented. Everything is unprecedented. Nothing like this has happened, certainly in recent memory. In this season of life, we are all in a storm. We might be coming out of it. We'll see what is ahead in the weeks and months ahead. But there is a storm. But if you allow me to stretch the metaphor slightly, I would suggest that we aren't all in the same boat. Let me explain. Some of us are in luxury liners. Financially, this experience you have been fine throughout. Your home has has space and comfort. You have been supported and cared for. And this season has actually been okay. It's not perfect, but considering what's happening globally, this is okay. It's pretty good. It's quite comfortable. For some of you, your boat is okay. But financially, there's little or no money left. Possibly you haven't been paid in months. Maybe your business or work in this season has evaporated and now simply doesn't exist. It looks fine at the moment, but you're feeling the pressure and the anxiety in your boat of what comes next. Some of you are in big boats with lots of space, but you are desperate to have other people join you. This sense of isolation in this time has been almost unbearable. You're lonely and you're worried about when you can be with people again in a safe way, whether that's your children or grandkids, or whether it's friends and just people. For some people, they're missing hugs and handshakes, cuddles, that sense of human touch and presence. Some people are in small boats with too many people. You're looking forward to everybody going to school and to work and being where they're meant to be. You've seen enough of the people you love and you'd like to let other, some other people see them as well. Everybody has a different experience in this. Some of you in this, in this last season have worked harder than at any other point in your life. You'd love to have a boat, because you would just go for a little nap if someone left you alone for long enough. And for some in this season of life, you have experienced the death of a family member or loved one, a dear friend, And in the current restrictions and what is happening, this season has been exceptionally brutal and tough. Leaving people at the door of hospital is not normal. For some, this has been almost unbearable. I do think over the past three months, the quarantine, isolation and the impact of social distancing has been very different for everyone, depending on their family circumstances, their even their personality type, their income, their home size and space around them in their garden. And that's before we get to any of the very real difficulties for people who are in circumstances where they are unsafe or in danger for themselves or for relatives around them. In which case, to use the metaphor, this this current storm was on top of a previous storm. And so everybody has been in a storm but has experienced that storm differently. So what might this little story that we find in Luke's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel and in Matthew's Gospel, and when stories appear in all three Gospels, I think they bear a little bit more attention. I want you to see in Luke's account where Jesus is in this story. I find incredible comfort, and I really hope that you do too, that Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is in the storm. There's a very real danger for followers of Jesus that when life is hard, we might begin to think or begin to doubt that Jesus is with us. We may begin to believe that he is away, that Jesus has left us. But what we see in this little story is that Jesus is in the middle of the storm. Jesus is with his disciples. There is a great truth of life here. 
In Jesus, we have God coming down to be with us. In a few months, hopefully, we will gather in this space and sing, Emmanuel, God is with us. It is in his name that God is with human beings. And we see it clearly in this little story that Jesus is in the boat. He is with the disciples when they need him. But it does take a while for the disciples to focus on Jesus. And Jesus' question can cut a little bit like a scalpel with the precision to cut right to the heart of the issue. As Jesus says to the disciples, where is your faith? Where is your trust? Tom Wright, the New Testament scholar, writes that there's really three main responses to where in general in society we put our trust. Some people are Stoics, really that unpacks into, you think life is just the way it is. It's quite fatalistic and you can't do anything about it. I think we probably see this unpacked at a greater level on tea tiles where it says, keep calm and carry on. It's the resilience. It's the idea that you can do nothing about the circumstances and just keep going. Another way that we might try to get through life is seeing life as being completely random and you can do nothing about that. But the response is slightly different. It's to make yourself as comfortable as you can. This is what we encounter in most of the Western world. The sales of one billion pounds extra in one week on groceries as lockdown began. You'll have seen the queues as of I for off licenses. Sales are up 30%. You'll see that TV is being watched more, 40% more for regular TV and news is up two thirds, 66%. People are looking after themselves and giving themselves comfort. This is the result that we have entertained ourselves and treated ourselves to get through the last three months. And then finally, well not finally, the third one would be the Platonists. The idea would be that this life is not real life. That there is a better life outside of this and we are destined for somewhere better. Some Christians adopt this mindset but it's not actually a Christian mindset. It's an idea that all of the action is elsewhere. We're going to be somewhere else so none of this matters. The fourth response would be, maybe you would say that you don't have faith in God or even that there is no God. I would suggest to you that if all we are as human beings is a collection of cells and atoms that will exist in this particular form for a short while and then will reconfigure when we die, if there is no God and no further meaning than the here and now, then logically people dying to coronavirus actually doesn't matter. If there is no deeper meaning and all we are is cells, then people dying is really unimportant. I actually think very, very few people really believe this. And one of the ways that you see that people don't believe this would be on Thursdays at 8 o'clock. People open their front door, people step out onto their street, they clap, they applaud, they bang saucepans, they've been letting off fireworks and and, um, sounding the horn at the shipyard. Because we clap the NHS and frontline workers. Because people are important. People are giving their time and labour and skills and energy and other people are affected by that and we cheer that on because human life is precious. People matter. The idea that none of this matters, actually, I'm not sure anybody really believes that because we believe even that we ourselves are precious and those we love and care about. I actually don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't want to be loved and to love. But it's important to flesh out the idea of where having no faith would take you. I wonder in this season of life, where have you placed your trust? What is it that you've placed your hope in? We see here, and this gives us some comfort this morning, that the disciples had a complete wobble. They were full of fear and anxiety in the face of the natural world. Anxiety is the feeling of dread that things are not going to be okay. The disciples feel anxious because they think the experience on the boat is not going to be okay. They have a boat and they have placed their trust in that, they have taken to sea in that. But it has run out in the face of the storm. They no longer have faith in the boat. They have four experienced sailors on the boat, but their gifts and abilities cannot get them out of this. Maybe in this season you have placed your trust in your skills or abilities, or even in your home to protect you. And if we're honest, we probably all do that a little bit. We trust what we can control. I want to encourage you this morning in our lives when it is hard and difficult, when we feel anxious and stressed. One, 
that Jesus is in the boat with us. Jesus is with us in our lives as life is happening. Satan actually wants us to believe that he's not, that you're on your own, that you're stuck, that Jesus is far off and remote. But that is a lie. As we heard earlier in the kids' talk, Deuteronomy 31 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Jesus himself says in John chapter 14, because Jesus explains that he's going to, be, going to go to be with God the Father, but look what he tells his followers. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus is going away. But he will send the Holy Spirit who will teach us and remind us of what Jesus said. Because as Jesus says, the Holy Spirit gives us peace. His peace. And we will see Jesus' will for his followers that your hearts will not be troubled and that we wouldn't be afraid. I think this is such an encouragement for us today. If we are followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us of what Jesus said. This is where we find truth. Maybe in this period you've paid more attention to the evening news rather than the good news of Jesus. I know that I personally need the deep peace that Jesus speaks of. This harmony and peace of not being troubled, of not being afraid. And I know that you need that too. You can be keep calm and carry on. You can also be, this is rubbish, I'm just going to find comfort where I can and give yourself pleasure where you can find it. You can also just wait for another world where life is better and wish this one away. But as we look at this story, as we see the disciples in the boat, in the storm, you almost want to shout to them as you read it, speak to Jesus. He is the only one who can meet us in our point of need in the storm. And he is the only one who can still the storm. And the second simple point this morning of how we do that is to put into practice by doing the same thing the disciples did, by talking to Jesus. We pray to Jesus, the Jesus who is with us in what is happening. Paul in in his letter into the Thessalonian church says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In Philippians, Paul again tells a local church, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you see this, you do get a pattern. Jesus wants us to pray to him, and in that prayer to intentionally give thanks, but also bring everything that is happening And as a result of the Holy Spirit's action in our lives, peace begins to move in. We aren't with Jesus day to day like the disciples, but we do have his word to us. We have more than the disciples even had, as we have the whole Bible. The disciples were writing the Bible as they did this. I would love to encourage you in this season to read your Bible. To pause, to sit down, to set your phone somewhere else, because your phone is really designed at this stage to distract you if you have one. Turn off the TV and to slowly take some time to read your Bible. If you're out of rhythm and practice of doing that, read one of the Gospels. Pray one of the Psalms. Read slowly and simply ask God to show you more of who he is. And just briefly at the end, I'd love to just help you if you're not a Jesus follower this morning. Because this is the key question. That Jesus asks. Who is he? The disciples are left with that question which is answered in the rest of Luke's gospel as it is in Matthew and Mark and John's gospel. But who is this man? Where is your trust is what Jesus says. Christians are people who believe that Jesus is the one to follow with all of your life. That he was the son of God who came. He lived in the real world in time and space. He died and was raised from the dead, all so that we could know forgiveness for the wrong we have done and be brought into God's family. 
If you would like to know more, my number is on the announcement page on the church website, or you can message me through the Facebook, uh, through fa- the Facebook Messenger, um, and we can have a chat further about that. But that is the heart of this. Who do you say Jesus is? And this morning, in a season of struggle and storm, I would love you to know that Jesus is in the circumstances with you. He is in the boat with you. And all we have to do is to call on him. And as we find at the end of the story, everything is going to be okay. That's an eternal promise that we find in Scripture, that in Christ, everything is going to be okay. Because we believe God is involved in the circumstances of life, we're going to pray for the world around us and our community. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are the God who is active in the world. You are real and true and engaged in each of our lives. Father, we come with gratitude this morning for the medical staff, the nurses, all of the ancillary staff who are involved in healthcare, the supermarket drivers and the farmers and everybody who is involved in that long chain to get food to our tables. Father, we ask that all of those people who are keeping the essential services of our lives going and thriving in this season, we ask that they would know your care. Most of all, Father, we would ask that those in that chain who don't yet know you in this circumstance would come to know you. Father, we ask that they would know your blessing, your sustenance, that you would give them a good heart in this as they serve the community and the nation. Father, we pray for government, both local and national, as they make decisions that almost certainly are beyond what they can understand at times. Deciding how to act in this season must be so difficult to make decisions that will really impact the lives of the nation. And so, Father, we pray for wisdom for all political parties and all politicians who are involved in making decisions. We pray for the civil servants who are advising and giving um, input into that that you would enable them to be able to be the wisest possible people who have insight and father we pray for the christians at all level of local government as they witness in this season as they advocate for the vulnerable as government is meant to look after everybody we pray that those who are vulnerable in society physically mentally socially that you would work to look after them using the resources that government has at its disposal. And Father, we pray even in our own lives that we would be people who would do your will. You are aware of our family and friends who are struggling, of those in our church family who are anxious, who are afraid, who are struggling with bereavement and grief. Father, we pray that you would speak clearly to them, that you would bring hope into their lives, the clear hope that is found in Jesus, that they would know deep, full wholeness that can only be found in you. But Father, we also pray that you would use us to meet those needs, that we, as your people, would be used by you to do your work. And so we submit to your authority in our prayers, but also in our lives, and we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen. We're now going to sing our final praise together. Let us worship God.
then as we are scattered, but together and in unity with Jesus, we say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.